Hallelujah. Oh, welcome back. Welcome back to My Kings TV. We want to thank you one and all for continuing to stay with us here as we continue to teach the unadulterated word of God. I want to thank those on uh, Blog Talk Radio, uh, our new listeners and our new television audience. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and God bless you. Um, and at the end of this, at the end, I'm going to give you information. Uh, if you want to become uh, part of our ministry, our television ministry here at My Kings TV, I'm going to give you information at the end of our time together, and uh, you too can be part of this ministry. Amen. So let's get back into the lesson. We're talking about the different uh, offensive strategies or weapons. And uh, the one that we were talking about before we left off, as we're uh, on our last hour, was uh, binding and loosing. Binding and loosing. Now you have the power to bind and the force of evil and loose the powers of or good, or forces of good. The Bible says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever shall be loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Hmm. Now through delegation of power and authority from Jesus, you can bind and loose spiritual forces. But note that this weapon works together. It's a binding and loosening. Whenever you bind something, you also have to lose something. For example, if you bind the spirit of lying, you should lose the spirit of truth to operate in its place. The next thing, one of our powers, one of our, we're talking about our offensive weapons, is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Because when Jesus died on the on Calvary's cross, he loosed us from the dominion of sin and the power of the enemy. His blood secures our access to God and release from the bondage of Satan. The word of God indicates that they, talking about us as believers, overcame him, talking about Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 Salvation, healing and deliverance are all available because of the blood of Jesus His blood enables us to wage offensive warfare for the souls of men and women and bring deliverance in deliverance and healing in the name of Jesus Your power to overcome the enemy is because of the blood of the Lamb our next weapon is our testimony. Revelation chapter 11, I mean chapter 12, verse 11 indicates the enemy is defeated by the word of your testimony. Now the word testimony means evidence or record, like that used in a legal case in a court of law. Now you recall that Jesus often commanded people who had been delivered to go and tell others what God had done for them. Now as you testify or give evidence to the power of God in your life, you wage offensive spiritual warfare. And to be effective, your testimony must be based upon the testimony of the Word of God. Just as a lawyer in a court bases his arguments on the law of the land. In the name of Jesus is another offensive weapon. Now you've already learned that the name of Jesus is part of God's basic battle plan. Now the name of Jesus is a powerful offensive weapon also. Jesus said that in my name you will cast out demons, heal the sick, and overcome all the power of the enemy. Mark chapter 16, 16 verse 17. Now, the name of Jesus is not some magical phrase with which we conclude our prayers. 
It's a symbol of the authority and power that he has given us. You will better be authorized to use his uh, power and authority before you start using his name to war against satanic powers. So you better have, you better be straight because as those uh, 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 those two guys that were trying to buy uh, 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 the power of God, the the demon said, uh, "Paul, I know, mm -hmm. Jesus, I know, but who are you?" and jumped on them. So you better be authorized to use those weapons, that name. Now, the we're going to look at, as we finish out this last hour, we're going to look at the natural parallels of spiritual warfare. The natural parallels of spiritual warfare. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went by on thee, that thou by them makest mightiest a good war, good warfare. Now, the early church viewed their spiritual experience in terms of warfare. Protection is described as the armor of God. The word of God is compared to a sword. Satan's attack are fiery darts, and faith is the good fight. Now believers are told to war a good warfare. So why did God choose the example of natural warfare to describe what is happening in the spiritual world between the forces of good and the forces of evil? Well, the answer is found in a basic biblical principle. God uses natural principles to explain what is happening in the spiritual world. We can understand what we see in the natural world. When parallels are drawn between something in the natural world and the spiritual world, then we can understand the spiritual world because of the natural. Jesus used this principle often. He used the example of a natural harvest to illustrate the great spiritual harvest to which he was calling laborers. But there are many parallels between natural harvesting and harvesting in the spiritual world. The same is true in relation to warfare. There are many principles of natural warfare which have been studied and applied by experts at physical war. These natural principles are applicable in the spiritual world. This particular lesson we're studying now presents principles of natural warfare and applies them in the spiritual realm. It reveals why God used natural warfare to describe the ongoing spiritual war in which believers are engaged. Now here are just a few principles of the parables uh, 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 natural principles of warfare that are parallels of the spiritual battle. First of all Let's look at what the definition of war is. A simple definition of war in the natural world is an act of force intended to compel our opponent to fulfill our will. Now this definition is applicable also in the spiritual world. Satan constantly is using the forces of evil to compel us to fulfill his will. Now when a nation is at war, a lifestyle of that nation is afflicted. Men give up their jobs to fight for their nation. They spend hours in preparation and training. Funds are drawn from the economy to aid in the battle. Residents are alert to the invasion and extra guards are posted at, natural, at uh, national borders. In the spirit world, Many believers are totally unaware of the warfare waging around them and have not adopted a wartime lifestyle. Church fellowship plan programs and parties, but they don't have a battle plan. They live in luxury and ease while the enemy is claiming the souls of unnumbered men and women without Christ. Members of the fellowship are discouraged, depressed, and living in fleshly sins. They are victims of a war 
they don't even know exists. You must understand, we are at war. We should adopt a wartime lifestyle in the spirit world. Spiritual warfare should become the focus of our lives. We should spend time in preparation and training. We should learn of and put our to use our spiritual weapons. We should designate material wealth to extending the gospel message of Jesus Christ to claim nations being threatened by Satan. We should be alert to invasion from the enemy and post extra guard at the borders of our heart, mind, tongue, soul, spirit, home, community, and church fellowship. We are at war. And our lifestyle in the spirit world should reflect it. The main objective of warfare in the natural world is victory over the enemy. This is also the main objective in the spiritual world. To achieve victory in the natural warfare, there are many short-range objectives that must be met. Individuals' battles must be won and separate territories claimed. Each of these individual battles contributes to the final goal of victory. The same is true in the spirit world. Our long-range goal is victory over the enemy. But we must break down this long-range objective into more specific objectives. We must know the objectives God has for us in the spiritual warfare in our family, church fellowship, community, and nation. We must identify the specific territory assigned to us for conquest. Each soldier in a natural army has a different position and responsibility in the battle. The same is true in the spiritual world. You must identify personal objectives which will contribute to the overall goal of victory. The battle commander assigns objective to the soldiers in the natural world. God is your spiritual battle commander and he has set specific spiritual objectives for you as a soldier in his army. Now knowing the objective for war is not enough. A soldier must receive basic training on how to achieve these objectives. In the natural world, this training includes learning about the enemy, his tactics, how to use the weapons of warfare, and the battle plan. In the spiritual world, believers often enter the battlefield without this basic training. They don't understand the tactics of the enemy. They are not aware of their spiritual weapons and how to use them, and they have not studied the battle plan of God, which is God's written word. In the natural world, to send a soldier to the battlefield without basic training results in defeat and death. The same is true in the spirit world. You must be trained in spiritual warfare if you are to experience victory. When a soldier enters basic training in the natural world, he leaves civilian life behind. He's no longer entangled with civilian affairs, but is concerned with the army in which he has enlisted. In the spiritual realm, in order to war a good warfare, we must not be entangled in the affairs of life. We are not civilian citizens of this present world. We are warriors in the kingdom of God. Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that war entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Enemy nations always spread false propaganda or information about each other. Satan also injects false propaganda into your mind if you allow it. Now we're going to we're going to learn more as we go into another lesson called the battlefield, the battle in the mind. Um, now one of the strategic uh, strategies of nations at war is to weaken the enemy by diplomatic proposals. Mm -hmm. Diplomatic proposals. These are suggestions of compromise. Through such proposals, each nation tries to gain advantage over the other. Mm -hmm. In spiritual warfare, Satan attempts to make believers compromise with sin. He knows such diplomacy will result in spiritual weakness. 
When nations are at war, there is always an intricate organization of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Each side has intelligent forces dedicated to gathering information about the other. The intelligent forces collect and analyze all available information on the enemy. They, com they communicate what they have learned to the soldiers engaged in combat. In spiritual warfare, your knowledge of the enemy and his tactics are vital to victory. The Bible is your intelligence manual, which reveals information on the enemy. And as you learn of Satan's strategies and spiritual counter strategies, you should communicate these to other believing soldiers. Satan gathers information on you too. He learns your points of weakness and targets them with offensive attacks. Now armies in the natural world use both offensive and defensive strategies. As you have already learned, offensive warfare is an aggressive advance against an enemy. Defensive warfare is when the enemy attacks and you must defend your territory. You have learned that parallels of both offensive and and defensive warlike situation exists in the spiritual world. When Satan attacks, you must def use defensive spiritual warfare. When you are claiming new territory for God, such as sharing the gospel with those who have never heard it yet, you are conducting offensive warfare. You are claiming new territory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A great general in the natural world once told his troops, we are not going to dig foxholes and wait for the enemy to come shooting at us. We're going to move ahead and move fast. Now a foxhole, a foxhole is a hole in the ground which a soldier in which a soldier can hide. The general said, Hallelujah. When you dig, when you dig a foxhole, you dig a grave. So when you are in the in that foxhole and and, and and fire at that enemy, he knows your exact location. We will keep moving, and the enemy will always hit where we have been and not where we are. This general didn't believe in defense. His theory was that if the enemy was constantly under attack, there would not be any need to defend. He realized that the force moving in offensive warfare had advantage over the defending forces. He said, we will fight on our terms and we will win. In spiritual warfare, he who understands the objective of warfare as the defeat of the enemy will not easily be reduced to a defensive position. To gain total victory, offensive fronts are required. Now in every war, there are weapons which are used. They may be simple weapons such as a spear or a bow or arrow, or they may be complex weapons such as a missile system. The soldier must know what weapons are available for use and how to use them. Some weapons are specifically designed for defensive warfare, while others are for offensive warfare. This is also true in the spiritual world. As a believing soldier, you must be, uh, be aware of your spiritual weapons and know how to use them. And as you have learned, there are both defensive and offensive spiritual weapons. The difference is that your weapons are spiritual weapons. Never be reduced to trying to use ineffective natural weapons to fight spiritual battles. Terrorism sabotage and ambush are all surprise attacks and are methods used by natural armies at war. These methods have two things in common. First, they are violent offensive me methods. Second, they all have an element of surprise. The target at which such assaults are directed is caught unawares is in, and is unprepared. Confusion and defeat usually result. As terrorists who sabotage and ambush, Satan also uses the methods of violent, offensive, surprise attacks. 
He will attack you when you least expect it in areas of your life left unguarded. Don't assume the enemy will furnish you with warnings of his attacks. This doesn't happen in the natural world of war. Neither will it happen in the spiritual war. Now in every war, there are decisive battles. These are battles which determine the outcome of the entire war. Decisive battles are important because of the territory involved in the fight. If an army wins control of a certain strategic territory, he can gain control of surrounding territories. In spiritual warfare, there are also decisive battles. For example, if you fail in the battle of the mind and tongue, it will affect your soul, spirit, and heart, and possibly your entire body. In the natural world, the greatest concentrations of troops are sent to a decisive battlefield. In the spirit world, this should be also true. Concentration of your spiritual resources in strategic locations is necessary for successful warfare. This true also this is true also in terms of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are times when the spiritual harvest is ripe in key geographic areas of the world and evangelistic forces should be concentrated in that field. Unfortunately, this is not always so. The greatest concentration of ministers at the present is is in the United States where there is a church in most every community and Christian radio and television programs readily accessible to every home. In the remaining nations of the world, there is the greatest concentration of population and many groups of people beyond the reach of an effective Christian witness. There are very few trained ministers there to reach them. The enemy is staging decisive battles in many of these nations, warring for the hearts, minds and souls of men and women. Meanwhile, our spiritual forces are concentrated elsewhere. Communication is a very important in natural warfare. The troops must be able to communicate with their commander to receive instructions and encouragement. The enemy will try to sever communication between the frontline troops and their leader. Knowing this will result in failure on the battlefield. In spiritual warfare, Satan wants to destroy your lines of communication. He will try to prevent you from praying and reading God's word as these provide instruction and encouragement for spiritual warfare. If you are so busy at war that you neglect communication with the commander, you can be easily defeated. Real ministry is a legitimate means of fighting the enemy. But if you run out of spiritual power, it ceases to be effective. Your power on the front line comes from communication with the battle commander. You must constantly receive his instruction and encouragement through prayer and the study of his word. In warfare, in the natural world, there are two kinds of targets. Moving targets, like planes, boats, tanks, or troops. And stationary targets, like like uh, weapons depositories, troop heads, all that kind of stuff. The moving targets are the greatest threat in natural warfare because they are offensive. They are on the move to conquer territory. In the spiritual world, Satan is most concerned about moving targets. He targets the men and women who are aggressively moving into the battlefield of spiritual warfare to conquer enemy forces. Satan will attack stationary targets, also believers who are not engaged in spiritual warfare. But remember, when you are on the move for God, you are a prime target for Satan. He wants to defeat your advances into his territory to claim the souls of captive men and women. Now in the natural, in natural warfare, when one side attacks, the other side counterattacks. A counterattack is an attempt to stop enemy forces from advancing and to regain lost territory. Satan counterattacks every offensive move made by believers. When you decide to pray more, read the word of God, or enter ministry, he will immediately 
stage a counterattack to prevent you from advancing. If you are aware of this strategy of counterattack, you will be prepared and not caught off guard. In military terms, there are basically three forms of attack. Similar attacks are launched by the enemy in the spiritual world. The first uh, form of attack is a frontal attack. A frontal attack. Now these are direct frontal attacks. The temptations of Satan are like a straightforward frontal assault in the natural world. These direct spiritual assaults should be met by resisting Satan which causes him to flee. Number two, a siege or blockade. A siege or blockade in the natural world is when the enemy takes control of territory not belonging to him. Spiritual bondage is similar to a siege or blockade in the natural world. The enemy breaks through your spiritual wars and part of your life is brought under his control. He doesn't actually possess the area, but he presents you from functioning properly for God's glory. The way to deal with spiritual siege or blockade is by using the powers of binding and loosing learned in this lesson. The enemy should be bound and the area of life under his control loose from his power. And, and number three is, is invasion and occupation. Invasion and occupation. When an enemy invades in a natural world, he occupies and controls a territory. This is similar to demonic possession in the spirit world. The unsaved or backslidden person is under the control of an evil spirit which has entered to possess them. The way to deal with this type of attack is to bind the enemy and cast them out. But in order to be effective in natural warfare, an army must be mobile. The forces must be able to move to the place where offensive action is to be taken. If they are trapped and held immobile by the enemy, they are ineffective. Mobility is a requirement in the spiritual world if you are to carry out the orders to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Are you a Christian soldier that has been immobilized by the enemy? Or are you actively pursuing the command to advance with the gospel message of Jesus Christ? A soldier doesn't put on armor and take up his weapons just to sit comfortably at home in front of a fire or to be sitting on the pulpit at church every Sunday or to be sitting on the roster every Sunday. He not only prepares for battle, he goes to battle. Mm -hmm. Some Christian soldiers prepare for battle but never leave the security of their home or their church to go to the battlefield. The war is going on in the streets of our cities and in our communities. It's going on in the villages, yet unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. No matter how prepared we are spiritually, we will never win the battle unless we are mobile for the Lord Jesus Christ. A soldier doesn't gain skills as a warrior by just studying the books on warfare. He advances in skill through experience on the battlefield. Study of your spiritual warfare manual, which is the Bible, is important. But the battle will never be won unless you put what you have studied into practice. Skill in spiritual warfare comes through experience and application, just as it does in the natural world. War is a team effort. Soldiers must cooperate with one another in their effort to defeat the enemy. They must come under the direction of one commander. They move forward as a united front. They don't fight in their own name, but on behalf and in the name of their country. Amen. Believers must learn to cooperate in the area of spiritual warfare. Instead of fighting each other, we need to concentrate our attack against the enemy. In the natural world, when a soldier is wounded, his friends make every effort to rescue him. When the troops move forward, they, mu they move as a unit. They don't leave the weak behind, but place them in the center with strong warriors ahead and behind until the weak have recovered from their wounds. The Christian army tends to shoot its own wounded. When a believer falls in battle, we gossip about him 
or give up on them. Instead, we should rescue these spiritually wounded and surround them with our strength. That's going on right now is the greatest hurt is church hurt. The forces of God should move ahead as one united front, not as a struggling group trailed by wounded warriors who fall and die by the wayside. We are not fighting in our own name. We are fighting in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are not fighting on our own behalf. We are fighting on the behalf of our spiritual nation, the kingdom of God. A soldier on the battlefield in the natural world doesn't do as he pleases. He follows orders from the commander. Total obedience is required. There is nothing in war of greater importance than obedience. The same is true in the spiritual realm. If you are to be effective in spiritual warfare, you must follow the instructions of your commander. In, in, in the army, anybody that's a veteran who's in, in, in the army or in the armed forces now, if you disobey a direct order, you're going to get court-martialed. See, you must be in total obedience to God. Now, a great general in the natural world once said, if you are afraid of being shot at, you will whip before you start. Fear kills more people than death. Don't fear failure in spiritual warfare. If you are afraid of being shot at by the enemy, you are defeated before you start. The Bible says that, that, that God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. The brave general also said, there can never be defeat if man refuses to accept defeat. Wars are lost in the mind before they are lost on the ground. No nation was ever defeated until the people accepted defeat. As in natural war world, there can never be defeat if you refuse to accept it. Spiritual battles are lost in the mind first. Refuse to accept defeat in your mind. Now one important general frequently expressed his personal wish that he could fight the highest enemy leader and the victor of the personal fight would settle the war. Now this has already been done in the spiritual realm by our commander and our chief, Jesus Christ. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus conquered the power of the enemy. The final outcome of the war is already revealed in God's word. But the rebel forces of resistance are still in the land. Jesus conquered the leadership, but to us is given the task of overcoming these pockets of resistance. In speaking about commitment, a famous general said, we are lucky people. We are at war. We have a chance to fight and die for something. Many people never get that chance. Think of all those poor people you know that have lived and died for nothing. Total lives spent doing nothing but eating, sleeping, and going to work. As believers, we are at war in the spirit world. We have an opportunity to fight and die for something. We don't have to spend our lives in routine monotony of eating, sleeping, and working. We fight for a kingdom to which there will be no end. We fight for a commander who has already conquered the enemy forces. Our victory is assured. We have something worth living for, fighting for, and if called upon to do so, worth dying for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not enough just to learn the natural principles of warfare parallels to those in the spiritual world. You must apply these principles in your own spiritual battles. Knowledge without application of that knowledge is ineffective. Review what you've learned and then apply it to your life as we enter the combat zone. Now during an invasion in the natural world an army enters the combat zone to conquer its foes and claim territory. Basic training is useless unless what is learned 
is put into action. Even a mobilized army equipped with, we with weapons is not effective if it stands inactive on the sidelines. To be effective in warfare, you must actually enter the combat zone. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verses 6 to 7, as I'm coming to a conclusion for this, uh, this lesson on uh, offensive and offensive uh, warfare and strategies. Um, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. Now you have answered the call to arms, and you've been inducted in God's army. We've studied about enemy strategy and territory. We've learned about God's battle plan and been armed with defensive and offensive weapons. Now, in this lesson, we're, we've actually entered, we're going to actually enter the combat zone and begin to fight. This lesson is the first in a series which is going to focus on Satan's strategies and scriptural counter strategies for overcoming his deceptive uh, tactics. Strategies are the science of forming and carrying out military operations. They are the methods or plans which lead to victory. Now Satan has organized methods aimed at gaining victory over believers. This is what Paul means when he refers to the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wild of the devil. Now the wild, the word wiles mean crafty or deceitful. Satan's wiles are his crafty, deceitful strategies of attack. But the believer is not left defenseless in the face of enemy attack. In his written word, God has provided a manual of strategies for spiritual warfare. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. The word devices means thoughts or purposes. The Bible contains counter strategies for overcoming all the power of the enemy. The word counter means to act in opposition to, to hinder, defeat, or frustrate. In the spirit world, a counter strategy is an organized plan and method of opposition to Satan. It is designed to hinder, defeat, and frustrate his wiles and devices. Now these next lessons that we're getting ready to get into are organized by strategies and counter strategies. The strategies of Satan in specific areas of spiritual warfare are discussed as we're breaking it down. Specific counter strategies for victory are then presented. Now, this particular lesson uh, will show us how the world and the flesh function together in spiritual warfare and counter strategies for overcoming these spirit, these evil forces. So next week, next week we're going to start on um, on uh, lesson lesson number 14 which is the strategies of Satan we're going to be we're going to be talking about we're going to be talking about the strategies of Satan which is battling the world the flesh and the devil battling the world the flesh and the devil and I just want to take this time out now to thank everyone uh, at Blog Talk Radio for continuing your support in our new in our new family here at My Kings TV. And uh, it's an honor, it's my honor and privilege to be here with you this evening. And right now, I'm going to take time out to explain to you. Uh, about my King's TV, because it was a, a a vision, long, long vision, um, and and I thank God for uh, fulfilling that vision. Um, but.